Welcome. My name is Katie Kalaitis, and I'm the Director of Research and Content at the National Hellenic Museum. And I am very excited to be joined today by Diane Cachellas. Um, Diane Cachellas is one of the world's foremost experts on Greek and Mediterranean cuisine, and she is the host, creator, and co-producer of My Greek Table, the award-winning 13-episode per season cooking travel show about Greece that airs nationally on public television and is in its fourth season. The fifth season is in development, so keep watching your local PBS station. Diane hails from the Blue Zone Greek island of Ikaria and New York City and brings a combination of innate Blue Zone wellness and result-oriented New York City spirit to everything she does. She is an award-winning author of more than 18 books on Greek and Mediterranean cuisine and runs the Glorious Greek Kitchen on, Ikari uh, on Ikarian cooking every spring and fall on the island. She in which she introduces guests to a life-enhancing experience that involves cooking garden-fresh, healthy, mostly healthy, plant-based Greek and Mediterranean recipes and cultural immersion into the folkways of the unusual Greek island. Dan also organizes culinary trips and walking tours in Greece and cooking classes throughout the United States. Diane has been a consulting chef for many of the top Greek restaurants in the United States, and has worked in university dining halls such as Harvard, Yale, and UMass Amherst to bring healthy Mediterranean cooking to, stu to the student dining hall. She has appeared on a, as a guest on many American food shows, including Martha Stewart, Throwdown with Bobby Flay, a personal favorite, The Today Show, and CBS Sunday Morning. Diane, thank you so, so much for being with us. This is truly the piece de resistance of, of um, our Spice Month. And I'm just so, so excited to have you here. So thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yeah. <laughs> um, so before we um, talk, we're, today's program is called Mastic, the, the Queen of Spices. And we're going to talk about spices and things. But um, before we get started, I'd like to hear just a little bit about yourself. Obviously, we've heard your bio but about your career and how you came um, to, to work sort of in this space of, of sort of translating Greek cooking and its benefits um, to a, a Western audience. Uh, well, I came from a journalism and writing uh, background. Uh, that's what I studied. That's what I had wanted to do. And, you know, sometimes things happen by accident or by twist of fate, whatever, and your like your path takes a direction you weren't expecting. Um, and that's kind of what happened. I was working in New York. I was in my maybe mid twenties and I was working for a cultural magazine for doctors. And one of the things I was doing there was editing uh, the food column. I mean, I grew up in a Greek family, so <laughs> food is, you know, you know, yeah. right? <laughs> and my dad was the cook in our family. And uh, I, I, it was, new, you know, it was also a really fun time in New York. I was in, I was young and I had, was start, you know, exposed to all sorts of things that I had never been exposed to before in this, in this job. It was also the era of, you know, you could take two hour lunches and come back, you know, having had a, your first martini, you know, I never had had a martini before I, got, you know, sort of editing the food column for this magazine, uh, tasted things like caviar and, you know, just a lot of firsts. And the person who was um, the columnist at the time was actually a very well-known food writer named John Mariani. And he kind of took me under his wing and, uh, one day over those crazy, like 19, one of those crazy 1980s lunches, I happened to mention that there had not been a book published in English about Greek food for about 10 years. So he suggested I write up a proposal, which I did. And he introduced me to his agent and we shopped and, you know, she liked the idea and we shopped the book around in New York. It, was, it took a year to sell it. And that was probably 1988. Um, I was like 28 years old or something. <laughs> and I got this book contract and I came to Greece. And my spouse at the time was 
uh, also a young artist and he sold a big painting and I had this little book advance and I think we came to Greece with like $3,000 between us and rented this old house in the middle of Athens um, and I started to cook and research the cuisine here and I was we were I was I was running, you know, sort of like a private restaurant for starving artists for a year, <laughs> and, you know, testing all the recipes. And, you know, it's very, it's, you know, and it was actually great because I learned, to, I taught myself how to cook writing this book. But I also did research and, you know, met people in markets and would speak to, you know, home cooks that I would meet in that the Laiki at the farmer's market or, you know, I got to travel around Greece a little bit. So that's kind of how I got started. And uh, that first book was called The Food and Wine of Greece. It's still in print almost, you know, more than 30 years later. Impressive. And it's still the kind of down and dirty Greek cookbook. And if you want to know how to make moussaka, pastizio, you would like, yeah, you know, all the classics, they're in there. And I, um, you know, once you have a taste of what it's like to publish something, it's very gratifying. So I went on to, I was hooked, I, you know, I wanted to keep doing it. That's so amazing. then I, you know, that's kind of what I did. And I, you know, wrote more book proposals, got more books published and kind of got, got my start that way. That's, that's so, I think what's so like, um, you know, what's interesting about that first is like just some of the weird ways life works out, but also, you know, you were in Greece then also at the, a very interesting time in Greek history, right? Like as, as you know, in the 80s and early 90s in Greece, as it was sort of undergoing this transformation as well. So yeah, that was, I know that's not one of the questions I, I had proposed before, but I, so I, I, I'm sort of fascinated by that period in Greek history. Yeah, it was, it was a great time to be here. I mean, we moved to Greece. I moved to Greece when I was in my very early 20s, in the early 80s, that was also a very interesting time here. The country was emerging from the years of, you know, the junta. Yeah. Uh, it was, there was a lot of EU money uh, just kind of in the air, you know, like <laughs> practically flying off people's balconies. And there was, a, it was a great optimistic uh, time of, of, you know, sort of expansive time in the early 80s. And I was a kid. I mean, I didn't know what I was doing. I was, you know, I was just here because I, I had gotten my first taste of corporate America and realized when I, it, it dawned on me that it would be two weeks vacation for the rest of my life. I, and I would have to fight to take them together. And I would, you know, not be able to go to Icaria for more than two weeks at a time. I just, I realized I had a very early self-realization that I didn't want that in my life. Not that there's anything wrong with it. It just wasn't for me. So I struck out. I've always been, you know, sort of independently employed. But, um, but then when I moved back to Greece as a sort of, I guess we moved back permanently in the early 90s. And that was a very interesting time to be in Greece because it was, there was an explosion of activity. It was also an affluent time. Um, you know, the EU and Greece were finding their way together. The supermarket situation just, it, it just exploded. You know, there was all this amazing new food that was never, had never been in a Greek supermarket before. And it was also a time when a lot of young Greeks who had left and studied abroad came back to the country. And they came back and they had had experiences, you know, after living overseas for, you know, eating things like sushi and Asian food and, you know, all this other stuff that was not available at the corner Taverna or Subladidico. And they changed, they, their demand changed the face of, of restaurant life in Athens. So I was by then working for a big Greek newspaper here. Greece has been good to me. I, you know, I've had all the things I've ever wanted to do in my life. I back, basically, you know, did them in Greece. I always wanted to work for a big newspaper. I worked for a big newspaper in Greece called Tanea. I was the food columnist. Um, I, I wrote 
I was the I wrote recipes, food history, and then I was the restaurant critic for 20 years. So it was just an incredible time to be here because it was like it was anything goes. You know, you spana copita with wonton wrappers and you know, the, like people with the waiters would come to the table and start to explain that, you know, oh, and this, you know, this yellow sauce needs to be eaten warm, but the red sauce should be eaten chilled and, you know, dip it in the yellow sauce first and then dip it in the red sauce and try not to touch the green sauce. And, you know, it was completely pretentious and ridiculous, but really fun. And it was a really great time to be here. And then, I mean, then things changed with the Olympics looming and yeah. the inter the international the embrace of anything foreign started to subside and the Greeks started to embrace what was Greek. And then there was this whole renaissance in Greek cooking. Uh in the I'm talking about restaurant scene. And yeah. that was also really fascinating. And then 2004 segued to 2008, 2009, and suddenly, you know, everyone was broke and nobody could afford to go out and spend 70 euros on dinner as though it was, you know, did it matter? And then suddenly there were all these great recipes for black eyed peas on menus because, you know, it was cheap, but it was good. So people, you know, so there was like a rediscovery of traditional food and but with a newfound aesthetic because the country had undergone this major social transformation. It's changing again, but that, I'm talking too much. So yeah, what's your next question? I think Sorry. This, <laughs> oh, no, I think, this is, and like, I mean, these are the things, I mean, on, these are the things that interest me quite frankly as a, like a scholar of Greek history. So I could let you talk all day. And also like the ways, you know, I never had thought about, so I think a lot about the way that the diaspora and, and the Greek state have this relationship, right? Like your life in some ways is, is a testament to that, right? This back and forth that many, you know, many countries that have a diaspora don't necessarily, a relationship they don't necessarily have with their diaspora where people return, people leave and come back. There's a sort of cycle in and out of the Greek state. Um, but the way that affects then Greek culture, I never thought about it in terms of the restaurant scene, right? So all these kids go to London and Paris to study, they come back and they want a good Indian restaurant in Athens all of a sudden, right? Like that, it, it, you know, that's so interesting. That. It actually went, it's deeper than that even because there was uh, what, what the driver were, was actually the wine industry. There was a whole generation of young winemakers who had studied abroad in places like Bordeaux, in Germany, um, and they came back highly trained. And there was a great school here, and it was called Butaris. And many, many of the most talented young winemakers worked for both, with the, the two brothers had the business together, you know, they worked for Butari's Wines and a lot of amazing winemakers then went on to um, open their own wineries. And the wines were more, they were actually more, they were ahead of the curve. And then what happened in the restaurant industry here in, at least in the 90s, I think the restaurants paralleled the stock market. So as the stock market, you know, Everyone was making a ton of money overnight. Old ladies were reading the stock, you know, pages, of, you know, on their balcony. And, you know, when you see that happening, it's sort of like, okay, this is like, this isn't going to last that long. But, no. <laughs> but, but what happened was, you all these these massive restaurants open, huge spaces in old like factory buildings around, you know, central parts of Athens that had been. Uh, you know, basically decaying. And so there was this renaissance and you'd walk into these enormous restaurants. For the most part, you know, the food in a lot of the, them, these places was almost an afterthought. It was more big social scene. And then everyone embraced uh, molecular cuisine. And that was pretty, that was, those were the, those were the dark ages for my palate. I mean, things like, I'll never forget we were in a restaurant, I, don't, I won't name it, where we had freeze-dried feta cheese. One of oh. the worst things I have ever tasted in my entire life that should not exist. <laughs> and it was like, there was like a little mound of it. Then we had, 
we had a, we ordered bacalhau scordalia like what what's more classic than you know cod fritters with garlic sauce and what came to the table was you know, very crispy cod. The cod was delicious. So the garlic sauce was in three iterations, one of which was this foam. So the the matri- the sommelier came to the table and asked us what we would like to drink. So, you know, with a mouthful of garlic, in my humble opinion, the only thing you could drink with that is, if it's wine, is retzina. Yeah. But of course, Retina was, you know, that was like saying, I want to drink, you know, dish wall, dish soap. I mean, it was, and we ordered Retina. They didn't have Retina on the menu. So we ordered a beer. But it was just, you know, it was this embrace of absolute, um, <laughs> you know, everyone was a snob. And, and, and I actually remember writing, you know, I, I, I kept my American journalistic uh, ways about me, which was very rare in Greece, in that I never, I always went incognito to restaurants and I made it a point, you know, really not to befriend restaurant operators because I didn't want my opinions to be compromised by friendship. You know, I really wanted, I felt like I was writing on behalf of the, the consumer. And that was that a lot of people didn't like, you know, it was like that shook a lot of people up, basically. But um, I remember writing that it was this, this Scordelia was like eating garlic flavored toothpaste. And boy, that chef was, he was really angry. <laughs> but anyway, but those were sort of like the fun glory days. But now things are a lot different here. Athens is undergoing another incredible transformation and anyway that's a whole other subject I'm, I'm absolutely i mean i i th- i think just as a side note well, i mean i think athens might be the last i mean it's the last european capital artists can afford to live in and i think that's a sort of interesting you know creates an interesting space right i mean you can't live in the center of paris if you're a if you're a painter or something i mean you can live no. in Athens, and like that's that's changing know, yeah no yeah rapidly this is the work of a young artist oh (laughs) lovely i greek the greek contemporary like art and music scene is of endless fascination to me it doesn't get enough and literary scene it doesn't get enough attention but okay i could talk to you all day about this but um, i think we we promised the folks spices which is um, right all right, so, sorry for the diversion. People, what they want, Diane. Um, so we called this program, which I now wish I had called, um, talked to Diane Cachelles about her early years in Athens, um, Mastic, the Queen of Spices. Um, could you explain to us what Mastic is and why it's the Queen of Spices? Okay, mas- Mastic or Masticha is a resin uh, produced uh, in the 20 or 20, I think it's 20 or 21 Mastic, mastic villages in the southern uh, on the southern part of the island of Chios, and it is. I think it's really a miracle food. It's. I think it's the you know the 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 queen of superfoods in in Greece. That's for sure. It's a very interesting um, substance because it's not only a spice. So what happens is you, in the summertime between June, starting in June, they, they, what they call, they embroider the trees. They basically splice open the bark in a very particular way so they don't destroy the tree. And the resin drips down, it's warm enough so that it's, you know, it's viscous, it's liquid. It drips down and it's collected uh, they usually lay lime or um, uh, I think marble dust, if I'm not mistaken, uh, under the trees. And these teardrops, and they're called teardrops in Greek, vakria, fall to the ground. They're collected, they're sorted, they're cleaned. And they're used in traditional Greek cooking. The spice is used in mostly in baking and it's a you know it's a hard crystal so you have to pound it and if you're using it in savory dishes you pound it in a mortar with a pestle and a little salt 
if you're using it in a sweet pastry or sweet bread or something, you use you pound it with a little sugar. You never want to do that in a spice grinder because it's also gummy. It's a natural chewing gum, as many Greeks will, you know know already. Um, so the bigger pieces, in fact, you can chew them. And masticha has it's it's a pen it's a um, panacea for all sorts of ailments. It's incredibly good for gut health. It's incredibly good for oral health. You know, gums and it's it's just one of these. It it has so many applications. It's the ultimate like therapeutic you know substance, and it's it's you know lots of scientific studies have been uh, done about masika, most especially pertaining to gut health. Um, but not only is it used in cooking, it's used in the pharmaceutical industry, it's used in cosmetics. Uh, but in cooking, and I say this from the perspective of, of a cook, it's one of the most incredible ingredients I've ever worked with because it, for A, it has a very unique flavor. It's, it's very hard to describe the scent or flavor of masticha. It's piney. It, if you overuse it, you have to use it judiciously because it can be, if you use too much of it, it's bitter. It leaves, it'll leave a bitter, you know, aftertaste. It's re, It's got this almost church incense-like aroma. And I think it's used in the, I think it's used in part of the mix for that. Um, and... It, it, it's I've never worked with a spice that pairs equally well with lemon, orange, any sort of citrus, uh, savory citrus sauces like an avgo lemon or a, just a lemon, uh, you know, lemon vinaigrette or a lemon marinade. You know, if you're doing, you could do nice, beautiful raw fish like a ceviche with masticha and lemon and olive oil. It pairs beautifully um, in, in savory white sauces, it, it, in sweet white sauces, like pastry cream, um, milk chocolate, white chocolate, dark chocolate, uh, berries, you know, berry-based uh, sauces. Um, it's excellent with in tomato sauces. It's, um, where else have I used masticha? Um, Oh, I mean, I haven't even touched on what it's like to drink masticha because it's absolutely delicious, the liqueur. But it's just one of these ingredients that has this incredible range of applications. You know, it's the Maria Callas of the spice world. The You know, the range is <laughs> that is incredible, right? And I just came from the, I visited the Maria Callas Museum a few days ago. Um, I've heard and, that it's, Anyway, I don't, let's not go on, on uh, I mean, I can- You can talk, can talk about Maria Callas all day, yeah. <laughs> but, so, but Masika is also, um, it's also used in, you know, the most traditional applications, as I mentioned, are in things like, uh, you know, the Christmas, our Christmas and New Year's breads, the Tureki, Christostomo, Christopsomo, uh, Vasilopita, you know, Easter bread, Tureki, Vasilopita, the New Year's bread. Um, it's used in cookies. It's used in uh, sometimes in Easter cookies in Kulurakia. Um, it's used um, I, in the traditional kitchen. That's I think that's more or less it. Um, I use it. I I make a cheese a tiropita with it, and I use masticha and lemon zest in the fill the tiropita filling, just with you know feta and a little bit of. Um, uh, maybe something lighter like anthotiro or ricotta. Uh, so it's just got <laughs> incredible applications. And it comes in different forms. You can buy the crystals. Um, I would recommend the crystals because they have the most, they pack the most punch, you know, the most flavor. It also is sold as a... Um, um, uh, an essential oil. And that you just need a drop of that. It's 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 very potent. Um, it's you. It's also sold in powdered form, like pre-pounded, basically. 
Um, and it's you can also use the liqueur in to flavor things. So I use it a lot in, in my cooking. I love it. Excellent. No, and just as a sort of uh, thinking about this, so you'd recommend the crystal form. Does that mean we need a mortar and pestle to break it up? Like, do we need like- You need the... a mortar and pestle because if you put it in a spice grinder, it's a natural gum. Oh. So it will stick to the blades. You'll destroy the blades. <laughs> okay. So if we, not in a spice grinder we like is what I'm hearing. <laughs> Don't put it in a spice grinder. No, no. <laughs> um okay that's so i imagine you know spices have usually have these very rich histories and they've had this sort of rich um sort of economic and cultural history um can you tell us a little bit about the history so the the effect of mastica on the history of its native hios like what um how is it sort of incorporated into the culture and sort of a little bit about the history of the spice i guess and um, what we know about its first uses do we know anything if we sort of comb comb old cookbooks and things what do, what do we know and we may not know much i am aware um i i think you might have caught me unawares on that question uh, <laughs> i have to i would have to research that a little bit but okay. i know it's been it's something that's been known in greece for you know, since antiquity, it's been part of the 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 flora of Hios, you know, for the thousands of years. I mean, it's something that's always been there. Um, and no, I no, think and, it, go I'm ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry. No, see, it's, it's sort of a native spice, which so many spices, like cinnamon, for example, are not native. So um, it's sort of interesting that you have this sort of native spice, right? Um, I'm sort of, and I, I think it was known as it for its therapeutic values, you know, since, I mean, the, you know, the, the ancient Greek pharmacopoeia was based on, um, what, you know, what was found in nature. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Right. Yeah, I mean, they, well, that was it. Everyone, yeah. you know, that was used. You mentioned uh, health, but can you tell us about some of those other pharmaceutical benefits? Um, well, I mentioned that earlier. You know, it's very good for gut health. It's very good for ulcers. It's very good for oral health. It's, you know, mastica toothpaste is really good for you. Um, I often will use the, sh you know, some shampoos that have mastica in it, in them. Um, yeah, so... Well, I, well, it's an important part of, so now that I know how, now that I know about all these benefits, um, well, I know it's sort of hard to find in, well, it used to be hard to find in Western grocery stores, but that's increasingly not the case. But where would you recommend we look for Mastika if we want to go buy some? Well, you can find it in, you know, any Greek or Middle Eastern shop will have it because it's also used in, um, um middle eastern cuisine as well a lot of it is actually exported to the you know to the arab countries because they also use it in their cooking and it's you know the whole sort of eastern mediterranean fertile crescent areas um and you know they use it um in the states you can find it i think there's an online mastica shop. I also sell it in my e-shop online. I mean, it's one of those uh, basic, you know, basic Greek spices that people probably use it more around the holidays for holiday baking. So I would guess that that's when it's, you know, mostly, um, you know, avail not, no, I mean, it's available all year round, but that's the that's the that's the time to look. Um, so I will. I have to go to my my local Greek um store today. I might actually buy some. You, you've inspired me, um, to 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 buy some mastika. Um, this is really really fascinating, and um, I, I hope you'll come back and join us. I'd love to have you come and talk to us at some point about um Greek restaurant culture if you're at all inspired. That um, I can so forever. <laughs> It's in constant, you know, it's constantly changing. Um, but the plant, I mean, Mastika has been part of the Greek 
culinary and and folk medicine world, you know, for a very, very long time. Um, <laughs> and it's one of many spices that are used here. I mean, the the Greek, the palate of Greek cuisine is more herbal. That is, I would think, I would say that it's more of an herbal palate than a spice palate. That's not to say that we don't use um spices like cinnamon and cloves and nutmeg and allspice those are the and maybe cumin in you know that's probably also in specific dishes something that greeks use but think about the foods that we eat it's really more of an herbal palate oregano thyme sage rosemary uh parsley dill fennel wild fennel um, chervil, which we find here in, in the wintertime in Athens, um, a lots of different things in the mint family, uh, mint. spearmint, double mint, pennyroyal, all those, you know, so it's, and, 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 and going back to the question of the therapeutic value of masticha, all of those substances are treated both as as aromatics in cooking, but also as uh, you know th um, therapeutic substances, and that's still a living tradition in Greece. So, you know, people always have a store of dried herbs in their um, cupboards. Even saffron has medicinal value, and that's something that. You know, we, you know, it was it, the saffron industry in northern Greece is relatively new, but saffron has been known, you know, in Greece since since Minoan times. So all of that, like that, those are very very old traditions, and they spring from our connection to nature and our understanding of the natural world, which unfortunately is knowledge that's you know we're not we're losing that because we don't live in the natural world anymore. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's what I love about, um, you know, I watched my Greek table in preparation for today. And um, I think one of the, other than, you know, sort of the fun sort of travel stuff and the, and the recipes and things, I think this idea that there's a folk knowledge, right, that's based around the kitchen, that's based around foods, that is being lost. Um, I think preserving that is a really important, um, you know, an important thing to do. And um, I think in particular, you know, a lot of this, this knowledge is um, centered around women, right? And passed around, you know, passed down among women. And I think that's an important part of, of history to capture. So I think that's, I think that's an important part of the work you do. I think that it's being lost with frighteningly, you know, with frightening speed. I mean, I took a walk the other day down Eolu Street, which is, you know, the, named after the god of wind. And in right at the end of Eolu Street is the Parthenon. And I took a, you know, walked, I walked the whole length of the street. And it was, it was an indictment of tradition and an embrace of global garbage. I, I was shocked. I haven't, you know, really, I hadn't walked around Athens in a very long time. And I was, I was shocked, but, you know, those traditions, hopefully they'll, you know, there are still people interested enough in preserving them, but in order to, for something to be preserved, it also has to be used. It's not just, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to see, uh, I wouldn't want to see, you know, a vial of Masika crystals in, <laughs> you know, in uh, the Natural History Museum, you know, in New York City. I mean, you know, you want it to be used, but, um, and it has been, it is something that's been with us and it's been mentioned in ancient Greek texts, you know, forever. I mean, the chronicler of uh, ancient, the ancient chronicler of plants, Theophrastos talks about Mastika, Pliny talks about Mastika, uh, um, you know, doctors, Hipp Hippocrates and uh, Galinos, you know, and the Oscuridis, all of those ancient, you know, wise ancient naturalists and, and healers knew the, the therapeutic value of 
Masiha. So it's been part of the Greek tapestry of, of you know, food and, and pharmacopoeia forever. I, th I think you hit on something so, you know, one of the transformative events in my life, I spent a summer with a great, great aunt, with one of my, my, my grandfather's aunts, and how much she knew about the land, right? Like how much she could make dinner. She'd go out, out in a back garden and in a wild space, right? Not even a cultivated yeah. garden and make dinner, right? She could, yeah. she knew what she could eat. She knew um, what plants you took for a headache or a stomach ache or a, um, and you're right, that kind of, you know, this is a woman with, with no real formal education, right? Um, that kind of knowledge um, and how it, you know, preserving it and things like mastica, right? Like the way that it's not just, it's not just the thing you go down to the Arab market and buy to throw in your your Easter bread, right? That there's more, that there's more to that. Um, I think it's an important part about preserving tradition. And I certainly think, and maybe you could comment on this, you know, the sort of movement around superfoods and natural health is one of the avenues where that can be, that knowledge can be preserved and shared in a way that um, falls right on 21st century ears. Uh, let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> you, well, you, you, you're doing the good work. So I always yes. ask, um, um, one of the questions I always ask people um, when they come to see us, um, as we're as we're wrapping up, we have taken so much of your time. Um, is what is your what is your first Greek memory? Um, is it around the table or in the kitchen? What's sort of the first memory that you kind of look to when you're thinking about your Greek heritage? You mean in my Greek memory of Greece or of being Greek in the no, United just, States? Just being Greek even in the United States, growing up in the United States or in Greece, where, wherever there's that moment you, you're thinking about, share, you know, you share your Greek, you share Greek food all over the world and to all sorts of people. What's one of your moments that kind of anchor you in, in your Greek identity and heritage? Um, well, I have to think about that. Uh, a lot <laughs> of moments. I, being a kid, you know, growing up in, my mom was born in the States. She was half, her dad was born in Nicaria. Her mom, her, my grandmother was born in Calabria. And my father was born in Nicaria. My father was the cook in the family. So I guess I have very early memories of his, just this, he was an operatic, big, friendly person. And we always had guests. We had a lot of people from Ikaria who would, you know, were newly arrived immigrants who would stay with us until they were settled. Um, so there was always a lot of food coming out of my home kitchen, my, you know, my parents' kitchen. And I remember the holidays more than anything, just, just this grand, you know, it, it was a production line of, you know, Xerotigana, which are diples, I guess, in, in, they're called diples in other parts of Greece, which are the dough fritters, uh, lukumades, um, uh, all sorts, you know, all the cookies and cakes for, you know, for Christmas. And I just remember it seemed to be the the few days before Christmas, there seemed to be this frenzy of of interesting smelling things coming out of the kitchen. <laughs> And, and I think that's probably one of my earliest food memories and one of my, and things that, and those, you know, somehow that was our normal. And then you, when you grow up and you realize that there are other people in the world besides us, you know? <laughs> um, I grew up, you know, in a pretty tight knit community of Icarians in New York city. So <laughs> experience of other cultures was very limited, even though I grew up in one of the most ethnically diverse square mile in North America. And I didn't really realize that until I went to high school yeah. um, and realized that, you know, when someone invites you to their house for lunch or dinner, you know, th there aren't eight things on the table, you know? <laughs> and there, if there are people there are eight pieces of whatever it is that the mother cooked that day whereas in the greek poem 
it's you know it's 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 excessive and i you know those are kind of the early memories excellent no that, that's that's wonderful that's that's beautiful and it makes sense why um why you keep coming back to it right um the way that kind of grounds you thank you so much dan i hope you'll come back and join us anytime um, i love to see them I, i'm always willing to I'm, just see them oh excellent so, and, well, and, 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 and <laughs> the museum is very good to me and you know the national the national hellenic museum supports my greek table so it's it's really um i'm you know i'm really happy that we're doing this well it's our so. pleasure and um <laughs> We will, we will, um, I, I have your email address. So you will, this is the last you've heard from me. So thank you very much, everyone. Once again, um, thank you to Diane for joining us. And we're hope to see you again very soon on another NHM discussions. Okay, thank you too.